Good morning, Moraine Valley Church. It's great to see you all. I'm a little bit surprised by how many are here, but encouraged. You guys just, you always blow me away. Your love for Jesus and honoring him on Christmas morning in the midst of the cold, the snow the last few days, it's great to be with you. You know, if you're joining us this morning, we've been doing a series we're calling The Rest of the Story. It's the rest of the story about Christmas. You know, we always hear that Jesus was born to die. And it's so true. And uh, there are other parts of the story. But this morning, we're going to focus on the fact that Jesus was born to die. Because that is the heart of the story of Christmas. And I want to, this morning, kind of tell you the rest of the story about why Jesus was born to die. There's a little backstory to that as well. And if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. There's some Bibles in the chairs beneath you. Some of you look on your phone, look on with somebody close to you. But uh, we're going to be looking at 1 John 4, 9. And actually, we had a little uh, tip given to us about where we're going this morning in the passage that Josh read to us this morning. In fact, we just sang it again. A son has been given to us. The government will be on his shoulder. He came to be the king. But do you know the last part of that passage? The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. God didn't just send his son because he had to fulfill his word. You know, when somebody does something with zeal, there's great passion, there's great excitement, there's great love, there's great energy. And when God sent his son, he sent him with zeal. Because he not only loved us, but he so loved us. And that's the backstory to Christmas. God so loved us that he sent his son into the world to die for us so that we could have life. We see this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. I love this. Kids, you're here. Some of you have been in school, have been to show and tell. And this is what God did for us with the birth of Jesus, is God has been telling us, and we read it in his word literally for centuries about the way that God loves his people. What we learn in the birth of Jesus is that God demonstrated. I've been telling you all about it, you might say, God said, but now I'm gonna show you just how much I love you. And we see this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. By this, the love of God was manifested. This is how God's love was made visible so that we could see it. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world. That's the birth of Jesus. So that we might live through him. Jesus was born to die so that we could have life. But this was a picture of God's love. He wanted us to see it in a tangible way. He wanted us to see his love in flesh and blood. God's love was displayed for us in Jesus. You know, love's kind of a vague word, though. You know, what, what does love mean? Let's bring that a little bit down to earth. We talk about love all the time, and it seems so general. Well, in the next verse, he describes for us what love is. I kind of think about the ingredients on a package. You know, you, you get some food, and if you're watching, you're eating. You look on the side and you say, uh, you know, how, how much fats are in this, and how much protein, and how much sugar, and all that, so forth. We, and we see the ingredients that are used to make the food. Well, in verse 10, he gives us the ingredients of love. Listen to this. In this is love. Here's the ingredients. You want to know what love is? And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. That's the first ingredient in love. Initiative. It wasn't that we love God. We did something first. 
and that God somehow is responding to us in what we did, and that was his love. The fact is it had nothing to do with us and our love. It had to do with God as he took the initiative to send his son into the world. So the first ingredient of love is initiative. We see down in the same chapter in verse 19, it says, we love because he first loved us. We are responders in love, not God. God takes the initiative to love, and once we experience his love, we love and return him and others. But the second ingredient of love we see in verse 10 is this. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's sacrifice. When it said Jesus came to be the propitiation for us, he came to satisfy our sin problem. He came to die to shed his blood so that you and I could live. And then we see the third ingredient in love is benefit. Somebody else benefits from it. He came to be the propitiation for our sins. He came at the end of verse nine, we saw that we might live through him. We're the beneficiaries of God sending Jesus, taking the initiative of sending Jesus, giving the sacrifice and the cost of his own son to die for us so that you and I could have our sins forgiven and we might live with God and forever. That's the three ingredients of love. Initiative, taking the first step sacrifice or cost. Somehow you give up something that's meaningful to you and benefiting somebody else. This is my definition of love as I try to put those three together. It's simply this. I think we have it up there. Love takes the initiative at your own expense to bless somebody else. That's the heart of love. It takes the initiative. I'm going to step out. It's going to cost me something to do this. And I'm going to cause somebody else to be the benefit. And then listen to what verse 11 says. Beloved, if God so loved us. And what he's describing is what we just heard is not only God's love, but God's so loved to such a high degree. God didn't just love us, he so loved us to such a high degree. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So I just want to give us two applications of this this morning. We see that Christmas is about the zeal of the Lord. It's about the love of the Lord. It's not about God fulfilling a covenant promise that he had to do. It's about God so loving his people that with great energy and cost and love and passion and zeal, he sent his only son into the world to die for us because he so loved us. So here's the first application. We saw it in verse 11. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Let me ask you this. Today, Christmas Day, this week, who are you going to take the initiative at your own cost? may cost you time. It may cost you putting down your phone and giving somebody full attention. It may cost you not you talking and you listening instead. Whatever it costs, what are you going to do today or this week to take the initiative at your own cost to bless somebody else? That's what God did for us. And then we see it in John 3, 16. Passage for God so loved the world. Here we see it again. It's not just God loved us. He so loves us. It's such a high degree. It's full of the zeal of the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There we see it again. God took the initiative to send his son at great cost that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's the benefit. God's love. 
God has taken the initiative to send his son Jesus to be born into Bethlehem many, many years ago so that you and I could have life because he lived a perfect life and he died in our place to pay for our sins. What does he ask of us? No. All he has us to do is believe in him. We love because he first loved us. It's not like, well, if you start living a real religious life and going to church every Sunday, or if you really clean up the way you've been living and become a little bit more moral, or you start doing more good deeds, then you're gonna have eternal life. That's not what he says. God took the initiative to send his son into this world at Christmas so he could die for you and me so that if we believe in him, we could have eternal life. Believing is simply this. It's not just intellectually, oh yeah, I believe Jesus was born and that he was God. It's a heart that grabs on to him with everything you got. It's a heart that says that I don't just believe that everybody in the world's a sinner. Actually, I believe I'm a sinner. It's a personal belief and faith. It's not an intellectual, biblical truth. Now it becomes personal, it says, you know what? I was separated, and I, or maybe some are here today say, I am separated from God because of my sin. What is sin? Simply, it means I'm not as good as God. I think we all can admit that. We all fall short of God's holy righteousness. And what God is saying is this, if you would believe that you are a sinner and that Jesus came into the world to die for you personally, and if you will lean on him and rely upon him and trust him to hold you up. You know, right now it's my legs holding me up. Now it's the seat holding me up. Now it's this. What I'm saying, it's no longer, I'm not trusting in myself, but I'm relying totally upon Jesus and what he did. And when I put my faith in that, the Bible says, God says, we'll have eternal life. We have a relationship with God. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. You need to remember today's all about God's love. It's a love that's a passionate love. It's a love that's full of zeal. It's a love that is so rich and so great that I want to encourage you today that if you don't know Jesus, make your heart today Bethlehem. Make your heart today the place where Jesus can be born again into your life. And do that by acknowledging to him, Lord, you know what? I have never acknowledged my sin to you before. I'm doing that this morning and I'm relying totally upon what Jesus did for me. And at that moment, you'll have eternal life. I'll be here a few minutes afterwards. Worship team, why don't you come on up and close us up? I'll be here for a few minutes afterwards. Josh, some others. And if you say, hey man, I don't get this. I need to know more. We're here to talk to you. Love you guys. Have a great Christmas. Take the initiative to love somebody else and make sure that you thank God and Jesus for coming to die for us that we might live.